one. I can't remember the exact number, but they had this whole shorthand. Um, it's one of the great partnerships of all time. You have Pesci in there too, who has done a few things with him. And then you're kind of crashing well, the party as, yeah, well, you, you, you kind of have to be brought into that loop. But what was that Scorsese De Niro thing like? I've always been fascinated because all the way even leading to the Irishman recently, those guys well, have I, such an amazing history together. I had to elbow my way in, you know, at first they would set up scenes sort of without me. Mm. And then I was like, you know, I would just follow Marty around constantly like Marty, 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 Marty. Hey, Marty, Marty. And finally he was like, you're a ter- like a terrier on my pant leg. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? And then I was like, you know what I want? I want you to come into my trailer in the morning. Like you go see Bob and Joey. I want you to talk to me about the scenes. I want you to tell me what you want. I want you to push me till I break. And he was like, that's what you want. I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want, Marty. And he's like, all right, you got it. And that's what started to happen. But it really took me, you know, shoving my nose at him constantly to get him to realize that I wanted to be in it and that I had the guts to be, throw myself at it as hardcore as, as they did. And so my part went from five weeks to five months. It's a really good movie. It's, uh, it's interesting in the relationship of the whole Scorsese De Niro catalog. It's such like a fun thing that they did that then five years after Goodfellas. And then you have the Irishman circling back all the way at the end. It's They it's are fun. the greatest team uh, that I've had the luxury of working with. You know, I don't get cast a lot in these type of things. Um, I wish I did, but for me, it was the greatest thing that ever happened. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe my good fortune. I felt really blessed. I adore those guys. Um, I felt really lucky. I, it was amazing. It was a wonderful experience for me. You also, you did, you did a movie with Sly Stallone, The Specialist. Right. So you, you did Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Steven Seagal. You had all three. And Carl Weathers, I guess, too. But Carl's what? great. Carl was great. And um, yeah, and Sly, we, we had an amazing time. Um, you know, he's, he is certainly as tough as they come, you know, when we did our, we did our own, all of our own stunts. Yeah. Everything. I mean, we really blew up that building. Um, and we had 12 cameras around the building and we did all of the stuff when the building was blowing and we did everything running through the fire of that building. And, and Sly was like, will you do this? Will you do this with me? And I said, I, I have one caveat. I have to be barefoot. Because I have to be able to feel the floor. I have to mm. be able to feel where the blows and the fire and everything are coming. I don't want to be unsteady on my feet. And I want to be able to feel where the fire and the explosives are coming from. And he's like, okay, that makes sense. I, I get the rationale on that. No problem. And he's like, just uh, hold my hand and I'm going to pull you through it. And I was like, okay, I, let's go. If you're going to do it, I'm going to do it. And they set the cameras and we ran through that explosives and that entire building blowing. And it was uh, thrilling. And I, I like that movie. Yeah, I like it too. And we had a great time making it. And we had the best cameraman and we had the best producer. Um, our director pretty much stayed in his trailer. Um, I don't think he could handle handle it. Yeah. Um, so lucky for us, we had the greatest cameraman who had shot so many astonishing movies and, um, Jerry, God, our producer, God rest his amazing soul, Jerry Weintraub. Oh, the um, legend. The ledge. We called him uncle Jerry. Um, and it was amazing to work with Jerry, uh, you know, my heart is even breaking saying his name and talking about him because the loss of him is the greatest tragedy. Uh, Jerry, Jerry's the kind of guy that the day my dad died, he called me mm. and said, honey, anything, anything, can I help you in any way? I mean, he's, there aren't very many and we're never 
In fact, I can't think of a single other person in this town that was as loving and good as Jerry. I liked his book, too. Um, Stallone versus Arnold. This was this was the defining this was the defining argument. If you're talking about sports like Magic versus Bird, Stallone versus Arnold was going there for 12 years. So they're, I'm making you pick. They're very different types of guys. Um, Arnold is super level headed, uh, super um, super feet on the ground. And even when, I mean, I really appreciated, you know, the way that he came back this year and made that really beautiful, eloquent speech and talk about where he came from and how he grew up and really explained himself so beautifully. I mean, I, I really respected that. He's a person that goes away, thinks, talks when he has something to say. He's a very level-headed person. Um, uh, Sly is an extraordinary uh, businessman, and he runs his franchise very intelligently. Um, I don't think people really, I think they shortchange Sly, and I think that shortchanging hurts his feelings. Um, because he really has brought billions of dollars to this industry. Mm. And um, I don't think people realize, like recognize him for that. I don't think that they stop. I think it was really good when he finally got nominated for an Oscar. Because I think that a little validation would go a long way with Sly. Yeah, even a movie like First Blood, which turned into the Rambo series, that movie's really good. And he's really good in it. It's a really smart movie about Vietnam War veterans, but nobody, it eventually became this whole patriotic superhero thing. But the first movie, he doesn't get credit for it at all. Right. And I think that he's been kind of shortchanged in the credit department. Mm. And I think that's been a little bit rough for him because, I mean, he has given literally billions of dollars uh, to this industry. And I think a little bit of like, uh, you know, some kind of like thank you from the industry might be might be nice. Mm. You bought Leo stock really early. Like literally you bought stock, you gave up some of your salary to cast him in one of your movies. But we, so obviously you weren't surprised that he became a star, but when, as Titanic's happening, what were you watching? What were you thinking? I really believe in Leo. I think he's not just um, a great actor, but he's super intelligent. Leo, um, as a kid, I mean, Leo, we took him for his birthday go-kart riding. I mean, you know, this is how long I've known Leo, you know? Yeah. Um, Leo is extraordinarily intelligent. Like, wow, you know? And it was so clear that he had this very just kind of classy demeanor because of his incredible intelligence and those kind of looks that he has, that he was going to be able to make this kind of career that had a had a was he was very leading man very and he had this kind of um innate understanding of bringing his tenderness and vulnerability to screen he just you know he just really had it you know and russell i always felt was the richard burton of his generation he had that kind of um Hyper masculinity, uh, and that he would play, you know, big heroes. I was not surprised at all when he started playing, you know, like ship captains and, you know, right. things like that, because he's very, he's got that, you know, and I, I could see that right off the bat when I first saw him. I saw him in a movie called Romper Stomper, where he played a skinhead. And people were, how can you, he just played a skinhead. What does that mean? And it's like, do you have any idea what it takes to pull off a part like that? And 
And that is a really hard part to play. Like really hard. Yeah. And just come off like a, like a, like a, just a, you know, like flat. Um, you know, he it was complex and. Uh, well, it seems like, it seems like you have such good eye for talent. You were ahead of your time. If you, if it had been like, everything happened for you 20 years later, you immediately have a production company and you're, you're handpicking people, making all the, using your power. It just w- really wasn't like that in the Sometimes early nineties. Studios would bring me into casting meetings to say like, who do you think we should cast? Um, but they also, there were so many rigid boundaries that, um, you know, they couldn't cast anybody that was not completely straight. <laughs> right. And they couldn't cast anybody who was like this or wasn't that or, you know, their heritage or this or that. I mean, it was just so absurd. Their casting ideas. I just could, it wasn't like I couldn't really think inside their box very well. Um, but yes, I think you're right. And I wanted to direct when I was, you know, hitting my success stride and they thought I was really ridiculous and told me so. Um, but yes, I would have been, had a production company, I would have been directing and I would have picked a lot of different talent than what was being picked for sure. Yeah, Even, even if it's like 15 years later, yeah. you immediately have a production company. You're doing whatever you want. You're teaming with whatever directors you're doing documentaries, all that stuff. It was just, I did produce a bunch of documentaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tiny bit, early. but I can't get them on the air. What was your favorite one? Mm. Um, well, I produced a short one, um, a 15 minute one about one of the youngest living Holocaust survivors. And it's one, oh my God, so many documentary film festivals. Um, that is kind of crazy. Um, and I just wanted to go on the air during like National Holocaust Month, but it's just very hard to get anybody to do anything when you're a woman, you know, look mm. at your product. I mean, this year, finally, people are starting to allow women to work. <laughs> mm. But yeah, I mean, I have really good ones. I have like, you know... A dozen. I have really, I have ones where we ask uh, women from every walk of life all over the world, the same 20 questions. Women that work in bordellos, women that are CEOs. We've asked women from every possible avenue of life, the same 20 questions. And it's super interesting. You know, we, I just all kinds of great ones. I don't want to step on some of the stuff you wrote about your health issues in the book because that's a big part of it. But um, what, how are you doing these days? I'm awesome. Yeah? Yeah, I'm great. Because you had, you had obviously a, a, t- a brain tumor, but then you had some after effects from that. But now, because at one point you were having trouble speaking, but now you seem 100% well, it, fine now. It was not a brain tumor. It was, I. you have two arteries. Yeah, in the, yeah back the brain, art, I'm sorry. Your neck. Right. And these two arteries control basically your ability to walk and talk and everything. Yeah, yeah. One of mine ruptured and I had a nine day brain hemorrhage and a stroke. Um, I'm great. Uh, I'm doing great. I, all systems functioning <laughs> as far as I can tell. Of course, you never know. Um, I think I'm doing good. I think I'm on top of it. And they had no idea why that ruptured. Was there any sort of reason? It's just totally random. You know, it's really interesting. When I went to the hospital, nobody asked me and nobody gave me a full exam. Um, it's really funny how women get treated, you know, um, part of the reason I, I hemorrhaged so long is because I didn't get a full exam and when they gave me my first exam, um, all the blood had pooled on one side of my head, but that was because I had had breast tumors removed and I was still healing and bandaged from that and laying on one side. And because they didn't know that, they didn't know why the blood was on one side of my head. Mm. So it took them, you know, another week to figure out that maybe they should give me a 